I'm Katie. I'm Anna. She's a psychotherapist. And she runs a photography empire. Together we make music and we podcast to encourage ourselves and you to do the things that scare us most. Hey everybody, Anna here. I'm flying solo today here on the Doing Scary Things podcast. And I just wanted to pop in and talk about this topic of your internal world. There was some really great stuff related to this on our most recent episode with Dr. Matt. And I just had a bunch more to think about after our interview with him. So I'd actually been thinking about this topic a lot lately anyway, but our conversation with Dr. Matt really brought some of these ideas to the forefront for me, and I just felt like I had a lot more to discuss about it. So anyway, definitely listen to that episode. It's just the one right before this one, if you haven't already, because it was mind-blowing. It was such a great interview. Dr. Matt is so insightful and such a joyful person. I think you'll love it. So, okay, let's get into it. Your internal world. Being aware of your internal world and not just aware but also familiar with it has a huge impact on seeing yourself in context. So, you know, how you see yourself in your relationships, in your community, um, how you see yourself in relation to a higher power or something that's bigger or greater than yourself or your faith. So we talk about those aspects of life all the time, but we don't talk a whole lot about the internal experience from which we are always operating um, in those areas and from which we're always working. So this might sound like really big and esoteric to you, and that's okay. I'm going to get practical with it also, so bear with me. Um, But it might sound second nature to others of you who already know yourself well or already enjoy or at least spend a lot of time in your own internal world. Um, You know, you might hear the phrase like, I'm in my head all the time, but I've got good news (laughs) for all of us, whether this sounds totally foreign or totally familiar. Your internal experience is a lot more than just being in your head. So it's not just mental and emotional but there's also a spiritual side um, and your physical body is attached to all of that. So there's kind of a physical aspect to it too, because we all have all these parts of ourselves, right? We're multifaceted, we're human beings, and the different parts of us each contain a lot of wisdom and insight that we don't always experience just in the form of thoughts. So don't worry, I'm not inviting you to just like get in your head all the time because If you've said that phrase or you've heard that phrase, you probably know it usually isn't a positive thing. It's like, oh, I'm stuck in my head. I'm alone with my thoughts, you know. So that's not the point of this. Um, But thoughts are certainly part of our internal experience or the conscious part. So, you know, our bodies know stuff that our conscious mind doesn't know. Our spiritual selves are, you know, the parts of us that long for fulfillment and connection and purpose. So if you can sort of turn your attention to your internal experience, it can give you a fresh perspective. It can encourage you. Uh, It can give you a sense of collaboration with the rest of humanity or a sense of reverence again like you know seeing yourself in connection to a higher power or something that's bigger than you and it's kind of paradoxical it really does make us feel more connected to humanity when we are willing to be and able to be aware of our own internal experiences like so the more we know ourselves the more we can understand other people and empathize with them right and empathy is a connection so I think for those of us who are doing scary things it's so beneficial and important not to shy away from our ongoing internal experience um You know, it's it's happening all the time (laughs) behind the scenes, whether we're paying attention to it or not. But I think it's really important for us who are doing scary things because we're out of our comfort zones a lot. And our internal experience has the potential to be a comfort zone that we carry with us in all kinds of circumstances. The more comfortable we can be within ourselves, the more external problems or circumstantial kind of discomfort 
the more of that we can tolerate. And doesn't that make so much sense? Like if we're not comfortable or secure within ourselves and we're in an uncomfortable, scary, unknown, unfamiliar situation, the energy and the internal resources we spend on regulating our own feelings and bootstrapping our way through some scary situation or new experience has to be divided up. So we're kind of spread thinner that way. You know, when we have to spend part of our energy on dealing with uh, an internal experience that's not known, (laughs) and then part of our energy on an external experience that's not known, I think our tolerance for doing scary things would be much lower, right? Because our our resources would be spread too thin, basically. So having a comfortable internal world can help make it so that the majority of our energy can then be used to press into the things that we're doing when we're outside of our comfort zones. And, you know, in theory, that means that we can spend more time, we can survive more time outside of our comfort zones. Don't get me wrong here. Our goals in life are not really about simply maximizing our comfort, right? We're not here to just live the most comfortable life we possibly can. I'm not, anyway. (laughs) That is not the point, right? So carrying an internal comfort zone with you is really about being able to bring courage and renewal and awareness and openness into new experiences in life, which are way more valuable than comfort, in my opinion. Like comfort is important and there's a place for it. You know, I guess I guess I'm arguing that the place for it is internal, right? We can be internally comfortable, but that still doesn't necessarily mean that everything is always predictable. So what does it mean practically to have an internal comfort zone and to know and be aware of and be familiar with your internal experience. So what that really means is making an effort to learn about yourself. Number one, learn about yourself. Number two, to accept rather than judge yourself and your qualities and identifying your strengths because your strengths and understanding, you know, your your character strengths and your abilities and your perspectives, those can all be tools that you have at your disposal. So you know exactly what tool you can pull out and use whenever you encounter something new or challenging as you're living life outside your comfort zone, as you're doing scary things. So it also means being aware of your feelings being honest and real about your motivations, and that includes your thoughts too, right? Like, what are the thoughts that are occurring to you as you're interacting with other people or as you're trying to do something you've never done before and you suck at it? Like, are you tearing yourself down in your thoughts? It's really important to take note of those things and to actually be aware of what your thoughts are telling you about your internal motivations or your internal feelings. It also includes keeping tabs on your level of exhaustion and your need for rest and spending enough time observing your own inner workings to catch glimpses of yourself changing as you grow through the new scary things and the challenging experiences you're having outside of your comfort zone. All of that boils down to experiencing a sense of internal security And there are certainly some kinds of security that we can get from external sources, or at least that's where we perceive them to come from. Like maybe it's your savings account or it's your closest relationships, right? There's nothing wrong with feeling safe and secure in those things. And in fact, if those things do make you feel safe and secure, you're probably doing something right. Like we need to create a safe world for ourselves, right? But that really does start on the inside. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately along these lines is what's really at the heart of feeling safe inside myself because I can't manage my circumstances all the time. I don't know about you, but it turns out I can't actually control everything. So for me, (laughs) I think it becomes the most clear what that internal comfort zone is all about when I am in a situation where I can't trust my circumstances or I can't rely on my circumstances, right? Or I can't rely on them to be predictable. 
and then I become the only constant in the situation. Let me give you an example involving money because financial barriers are very real in most of our lives and money is often a concern that we hear about as we hear people talk about stepping out to do scary things, right? And it's certainly a concern for us and our own scary things too. So um, if you've been listening to our recent episodes, you already know that I run a small eBay empire, as I like to call it, out of my garage. And since I closed my therapy practice, it's my main source of income. So I have a pretty large store for being like a one-man show. So typically, multiple things sell every day, but sometimes a day goes by in which nothing sells. Sometimes it's two days. And on those days, I think a lot about this stuff. And I it, that does cue me to check into my internal experience because guess what? I can't make people buy things from me. I can't even trust eBay itself to look out for me or pay my bills if I don't sell enough items this month. You know, my income is variable and it's totally dependent on randomly like other people choosing to buy the stuff that I decided to have in my store with no guarantees at all. So That sounds stressful when I say it that way, but at this point, it doesn't actually stress me out because I'm not ultimately relying on any of that. This is the beauty of the internal experience. I trust, now I trust, after years of experience of seeing seeing it work out and, you know, proving that my internal experience is trustworthy, basically, I can trust that whatever happens, I'm capable of finding a solution. I'm capable of asking for help. I'm capable of regrouping and making a new plan. And I'll be capable of executing that new plan. So it's kind of like if you find that you're the constant, then you have to learn how to trust yourself, right? And that means being trustworthy. And just like when we trust other people, you know, usually trust has to be earned. So that's why it's so important to pay attention to your internal experience of life. Because if you don't know what's going on there, then how can you trust it? So let's get really, really practical. How can you tend to your internal world? I'm going to give you three examples of the ways that I kind of check in and engage with my internal world. Um, just because they're my own personal examples that are handy. But there are a lot of different ways. So my first example is that you can spend some time in relative silence or in prayer. So for me, if I've mostly been living in my external experience, if I've been busy or I've been on or I've been taking care of other people or whatever, um, I like to have some silence and some solitude and some quiet Even if it's for five minutes, I like to turn off all the entertainment media, right? Like podcasts and music, which I love both of, but I like to turn all that off and put it aside and just pray or let my thoughts run deep. I love to do this while I'm driving. Sometimes that really helps me. Um, If I can't go like stare at the ocean, then driving is the next best thing to just let my thoughts run deep and kind of not be actively planning or thinking about anything in particular. Just think deeply and calmly or pray and process um, out loud while I'm driving. So for me, that helps bring my internal experience into the light a little bit. I also recommend journaling. I'm not a natural journaler. It is really hard for me to be consistent. But if I write even like three sentences, when I look back later, even if it's like a day or two later, and I wrote down three sentences, you know, two days ago, I can look back at those today and gain some insight into what my internal experience was at that time, because of my word choice, because of, you know, what were the few things I decided were important enough to get a mention in those three sentences. Um, you can learn a lot from your recently prior self <laughs> if you if you journal in any way, shape, or form. You know, even making a bullet list, anything can give you insight if you're looking for it. Another thing that's helped me is doing mindful physical activity uh, to see what wisdom or internal knowing my body might have. So for me, that could be simply paying attention to my internal experience while I'm just doing something normal like doing the dishes 
or it could be like very focused physical activity, like practicing yoga or running. I actually do the opposite of this when I'm running because I still stubbornly kind of hate running. So I try to like check out as much as possible when I'm running. But when I'm doing yoga, I'm like really paying attention and tuning in on purpose. So I probably should have a better attitude about running, but I'm working on it. So, um, you know, I might be asking myself things like, what is my sense of my body in space? Um, Are there any parts of my body that feel uncomfortable? What does my physical sensation seem to be attached to on an emotional level? Like, is it attached to any, any feelings, you know, or any feelings coming up as I'm having this physical experience of doing the dishes or of doing yoga? Um, and what are the qualities I perceive about the task? Is it soothing? Is it an inconvenient chore? Am I rushing through it? Is it gross because someone who shall remain nameless left nasty scrambled egg residue on the pan. Not that I'm speaking from experience. (laughs) Hopefully you get my drift here. You know, ask yourself a thousand questions like you're a journalist that's going to write a story about your internal experience. So um, to sum up, the three examples that I just gave of ways to engage with your internal experience that come from my own life are having some kind of quiet time thinking time, right? Journaling and mindful physical activity. But just to be clear, like I said, there's tons of other ways. In fact, I hope that as I was laying out these three examples that you were maybe thinking of some of your own examples. And we would love to hear from you about that. You know, how does your internal experience impact doing scary things for you? Um, So one more thing I want to leave with you is a set of affirmations relating back to the whole crux of this thing that no matter what happens, you'll be able to figure it out, that you can trust yourself to figure it out. That's my wish for you. So I want to give you these affirmations about your internal experience. I know, trust, and accept myself. My internal experience is safe and secure. I know myself well enough to determine whether something is a good fit. I love myself enough to say no when I need to, when it's not. I am capable and I trust myself to find a solution. Well, that's it for today. I hope this episode helps you as you keep on doing the things that scare you the most. Let us know what does help and tell us about your scary thing on our Facebook group or on Instagram. We want to celebrate with you and encourage you and cheer you on. Catch you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Doing Scary Things podcast. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe so you never miss one, leave a review, and share it with a friend. You can find our show notes and all kinds of other information at doingscarythings.com, as well as our new album, Whisper, under the band name Jasper and Jade. Until next time. Whoa, wait, how do you even do a solo blooper?